Howdy everybody, Mr. Bob, Bob Langston, your neighborhood naturalist from the North Carolina Zoo. I hope you're all doing well and want to thank you for inviting me to spend a little time with you once again. There's a, an interesting pathway that many of us who consider ourselves to be naturalists have followed. We see something, we get curious about it, and we want to learn more. And sometimes people, that's us, will assign a reputation to certain animals and critters, I'll call them, and often that reputation is not necessarily earned. When I, I first got started working as a naturalist, I was working uh, down at the aquarium at Fort Fisher, and I was fascinated with three types of animals that had those bad reputations. When I say bad reputations, often they are misconceptions that have been assigned to those animals. And the three animals I found most fascinating at the time were all S animals. It was sharks, snakes, and spiders. I learned a lot about them and I realized that eh, they're generally probably not as scary as people might like to think. There are some animals that live right here in central North Carolina that some folks find quite scary. One of those, as a group, we're going to call them bees. And quite often people will be running around the neighborhood, ah, there's a bee. Oh, often it's not a bee, it's a, a wasp or a hornet or a yellow jacket, in some cases even a fly. So there are a handful of really good, true bees that are found right here in North Carolina. By the way, honeybees are not natives, and we're going to talk about some natives, and I'm going to start off with one today. We're really privileged because we have the largest native bee found in North America right here in North Carolina. And I'm going to show you a few things about them, maybe dispel a myth or two, and we'll see what happens from there. But first, before we go too much farther, I hear something. It sounds like somebody's chewing. Something is eating the barn right behind me, or at least chewing it up. Let's get down and see who's chewing my barn. This is how most of us actually get introduced to carpenter bees. We'll see this large, shiny black bee that can almost hover in place. It'll be hanging around the wood trim of our house or maybe even like my barn here. If you look very closely, you'll see some sawdust being kicked out below the doorway. There's a second female carpenter bee that's up under there and she's digging a hole in the wood. That's how they get their name carpenter bees. They have really strong mouth parts and they bore these holes that are almost a perfect half inch in diameter. That's one of the reasons they get such a bad reputation. People assume that those tunnels are doing structural damage to the house. That's actually their nest. They don't go very deep and they usually don't do too much damage. That doesn't stop people from disliking them. Because they're so large and when they fly they can almost hover in place, many people get intimidated, almost frightened by these pretty gentle insects. It's not something you should have to worry an awful lot about. About a year ago I was working on a service project with the Unite Club up at McCrary Elementary School, third, fourth, and fifth graders. We were working outside under a wooden picnic shelter and there were carpenter bees buzzing the place all, all afternoon. The kids were sort of frightened and were losing a lot of attention worrying about these bees that might sting them. I kept telling them, you guys are probably safer than this picnic shelter is, mostly because of that ability to bore into the wood. In order to dig holes in wood, carpenter bees have very, very strong chewing mouth parts. To make them strong, those mouth parts have to be short. That's one of the things that makes them effective pollinators. Honeybees and bumblebees are really built for pollination. Their bodies are covered with hair and they have baskets, little pouches on their legs where they can collect pollen as they go from flower to flower. Butterflies are actually built more for drinking the nectar in the bottom and they have very long mouth parts. Since the carpenter bee has short mouth parts and doesn't have an awful lot of hair on its body, it has to get down in the bottom of the flower blossom to get nectar, tends to pick up a lot more of the pollen on its shoulders and on the thorax section of its body. That's the middle part of the body, head, thorax, abdomen. Carpenter bees, like bumblebees, are rather intelligent. Combining their intelligence with their strong chewing mouth parts, they sometimes will actually cheat to get nectar. 
and I'll say cheat because it steals nectar from other insects. What they do is instead of going through the top of the flower to get to the nectar where they would pick up pollen on their hairy bodies, they'll actually come around on the outside of the flower, chew through the base of the flower, and open up a hole. The nectar that leaks out, that's their food. To the next butterfly or bee that comes along, they have an empty flower. That's why we say sometimes they cheat to get nectar. Even though the females are equipped with a stinger, and both males and females are pretty stout as bees go, they're not without predators. This rather interesting looking creature is called a robber fly, sometimes called an assassin fly because they are predatory flies. They're not equipped with a stinger. They do have some relatively sharp, bitey mouth parts. As predators, robber flies feed almost exclusively on other insects. This is a picture I happened to capture a couple of years ago up at McCrary Elementary School of this robber fly who was just finishing off this particular carpenter bee. So as you can see, carpenter bees Often they're big and they can hover in place. They can be a little bit on the scary side, but most of us humans really don't have to be as scared of them as we might want to be. And what's really interesting about this, as I was pointing out with the robber fly, sometimes the guy with the stinger, or the girl in this case, the girl with the stinger is not the biggest, baddest bug on the block robber flies. They're predators and they can do some uh, kind of interesting things uh, to much, much bigger and more sturdily built insects. But on the other hand, those, uh, uh, those carpenter bees, they are the largest bee that's native to North America. We have them right here in North Carolina. You'll see them buzzing around the wood trim of your house. You'll see them buzzing around my barn. If you come to the zoo when, we get, when we're able to open, you'll see them buzzing around the wood trim of the gift shops. They're not coming after you. Chances are they're not interested in you in the least. So let's be respectful. They're pollinators. They do a job and they do an important job as far as helping plants and helping other animals and habitats to be more diverse. They pollinate the plants, the plants provide food for other animals, and also that means we have other animals that live everywhere. Diversity, good stuff. So, until we get a chance to meet again, thank you very kindly. I'm Mr. Bob, your neighborhood naturalist. Take care of yourselves, and we'll see you next time.